The most notable battle portrayed in the Old Testament was not fought between two infantries, but between two people. It was the battle in the Valley of Elah between David and Goliath. At this moment, the king of Israel is Saul. However, he had fell out of favor with God. David's arrival on the scene comes after God's rejection of Saul as king, although Saul is to remain king for some time. Samuel is sent to David's family's home to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king, but finds that none receive God's approval. 1 Samuel 16.7 But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not unto his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Only when the eighth and youngest son is called from the field does God indicate that this is the one who will be the next king. Samuel anointed David to be king. However, it was not so apparent to people that this young shepherd should be king. The Philistines are the Israelites' foes and they are gathered for war this time. It was not long ago that the Philistines were thoroughly beaten, but here we have them making head again. They descended upon the land of the Israelites, and it appears that they took possession of parts of it, for they camped in a Judah-controlled area. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim, between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. 1 Samuel 17, 1-3 The valley of Elah was more like a large canyon than a tiny valley. The ancient site was probably a mile broad, and it opened up considerably further at the canyon's mouth. There was a large hill to one side, perhaps a half mile or more in length. On the other side was a half mile long slope that stretched a full mile across. Bivouacked on one slope was the army of Israel and on the other the army of the Philistines. This was the backdrop. Now let's consider the major characters in our drama. First, there was Goliath, whose size and appearance were so impressive that the writer describes him in exacting detail. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. 1 Samuel 17:4. We don't understand precisely what that information means at face value, because we don't measure things by a cubit or a span. We count them by feet and inches. So, let's put it in terms we can understand. Goliath was a huge man, standing probably around 9 feet 9 inches tall. And if you add to his height the length of his arms when he would lift them over his head, you can imagine what an imposing creature he must have been. But it wasn't just his size. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. 1 Samuel 17, 5-7 He was clothed in what we would call a mail coat. The Philistines prepared for combat by wearing a large canvas-like undergarment with overlapping bronze ringlets. This coat of mail covered and protected the wearer from the enemy's weapons from shoulder to knee. Body armor of this type and size weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, or between 175 and 200 pounds in modern standards. Only the coat of mail was included in the armor. His spears had alone weighed 600 shekels of iron, or roughly 20 to 25 pounds. According to the written account, he had a shield carrier who marched ahead of him. The Hebrew word employed here refers to the largest battle shield, which is the size of a full-grown man. It was unmistakably designed to shield his body from opposing arrows. So, in addition to his body armor, Goliath had this guy racing in front of him, wielding a man-sized shield for further defense. Pause a moment and allow your mind to picture such an imposing sight. Imagine how frightening it would be to take on a giant of this size protected by this amount of armor. Undoubtedly, the odds are stacked against anyone foolish enough to face him in battle. Notice what this giant warrior did. Goliath stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. 
If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. 1 Samuel 17, 8-9 Goliath suggested a strategy popular in the Eastern civilization, namely, a representative combat, or a one-on-one -on -one conflict. He'd be the Philistines' army's representative, while Israel's choice would be the Israelite army's representative. Whoever won, his army was victorious, and whoever lost, his whole army lost. There's no reason for your entire army to be involved in this. Just send the fighter and I'll take him on. I am the champion. I am the greatest. Goliath didn't issue this challenge one time and then leave. No, his challenge went on for 40 days. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. 1 Samuel 17, 16 For well over a month, he marched out there every morning and evening, flaunting his size and strength, daring someone to challenge him. Meanwhile, up in the Judean mountains in the small town of Bethlehem, a youngster named David was looking after his father's sheep. He was far too young to serve in the army. In truth, David was probably unaware of what was going on between the Israelites and the Philistines at the time. He may have never even heard of Goliath. His only knowledge was that his three oldest brothers were serving in Saul's army. David's father, on the other hand, was worried about his three oldest sons. Jesse was becoming older and would be most likely unable to complete the journey across the mountains on his own. So he called his youngest son and said, David, I want you to run an errand for me. Take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these ten cuts of cheese to the commander of the thousand, and look into the welfare of your brothers, and bring back news of them. 1 Samuel 17, 17-18 David had no intention of fighting. His father had just dispatched him to bring his brothers some refreshments, and let them know that he was concerned about them. The sun rose like any other morning for both David and Goliath that day. David got up early the next morning and did precisely what his father had advised him to do. He left his flock of sheep with another shepherd. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench, as the host was going forth to fight, and shouted for the battle. 1 Samuel 17, 20 Then, as he approaches the Israelite camp's outskirts, he notices the troops preparing for battle and hears the war cry. He just wants to watch and see what happens. Then David hurried to the fighting line and entered to greet his brothers, leaving his luggage in the care of the baggage keeper. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath the Philistine champion from Gath stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. 1 Samuel 17, 22-23 Consider the situation. When David is standing there conversing with his three brothers, he hears a loud cry from across the valley, and all of a sudden, everyone in his immediate vicinity is racing to the back and crawling inside their tents. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. 1 Samuel 17, 24 Remember that David has never seen or heard this Gath giant's challenge. He sees a giant of a man, covered in armor, shouting threats and defiance, and cursing the God of Israel as he looks across the battlefield. And this infuriated David. Remember now, this is the 41st day the Israelites have encountered Goliath, but this is the first time it's happened to David. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in accord with this word, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. 1 Samuel 17, 26-27 Saul had developed a scheme to entice the giant to die. The problem was that he was the only man in Israel's camp who was capable of fighting Goliath. He was head and shoulders above everyone else, and he was the people's leader. Saul devised a strategy that would ideally pull someone else into the fray. He promised the guy who killed Goliath a large reward, as well as his daughter's hand in marriage and an exemption from paying taxes on his father's house. A bride, vast wealth, 
and a tax-free life don't seem so horrible, do they? Even yet, it wasn't enough to elicit a volunteer. The people in David's immediate vicinity informed him about the incentive strategy, which included a variety of external motivations. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? said David. Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. 1 Samuel 17, 28-29 Eliab is the son of Jesse who first walked into the house, and Samuel thought, That's the king. That was when God put his hand on Samuel's shoulder and said, No, no, that's not the one. And a little later on, Eliab was standing there when the horn of oil was emptied on the head of David, and the older brother saw the younger brother chosen to be the king. The younger gets blessed above the older. He said to David, Why have you really come? In other words, he attacks David's motive. Look, David, why have you really showed up here? After replying, David ignores him, and he just turns away. David knew who to fight and who to leave alone. David then meets King Saul. David to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around, because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. 1 Samuel 17, 32-40 this is the moment Saul inquires of David's heritage. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, As surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, Find out whose son this young man is. 1 Samuel 17, 55-56 So here's David dressed in his most basic shepherd garb and armed with his most basic shepherd weapons, his sling and staff, ready to fight. Then there's the turning point. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. 1 Samuel 17, 41-46 Imagine the possibilities. David stood unfazed in the face of this enormous creature. All David had was a sling and a stone against a giant wearing 200 pounds of armor. There was a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. One stone shot through the air with a whoosh, 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 and that was the end of it. Goliath was crushed like a bag of rocks. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack David, 
David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out the stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. 1 Samuel 17, 47 through 51. After that, the Philistines didn't hang around. They split the scene when they realized their champion was dead. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Shareim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. 1 Samuel 17, 52-53 Then David brought the head of the Philistine to Jerusalem. When it came to Goliath's weaponry, David had to use Goliath's own sword to slay him. He put his weapons in his tent. They stood there silently as trophies. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. 1 Samuel 17, 54 Giant Lessons Worth Remembering The pivotal conflict between David and Goliath teaches us four things. Number one, facing giants is an intimidating experience. With perfect perspective and a safe distance of 2,000 years, we can look back on David's daring and victory. But even with the eyes of faith, consider what it must have been like to face the intimidating presence of that brute. Yet David said, My God is greater than he. Number two, doing battle is a lonely experience. No one else can fight for you. Your Goliath is your Goliath. Ah, don't worry about it, someone else would reply. But it's a Goliath to you. Nobody else, not even a counselor or a pastor, not even a parent or a friend can fight him for you. It's lonely, yet it allows you to mature. You learn to trust God on the isolated battlefield. Number three, trusting God provides a sense of security. David brought down Goliath with the first stone. His aim was accurate and he did not miss the target. His faith in God kept him grounded. You will be unable to defeat the giant if you attempt to do so in person. When you have spent sufficient time on your knees, it's remarkable how stable you can be. Number four, winning victories is a memorable experience. We're supposed to reflect on our previous victories. We're supposed to pass forth our lion and bear tales, our own Goliath triumphs. Perhaps you don't know what lies across the valley. Maybe you can't get a handle on what the giant is, but it's there, haunting you. That uncertainty alone is a giant. But look at that worry in comparison to the Lord God himself and say, by faith, the battle is yours, Lord. It is your battle. I lean on you. I give you all my weapons, all my skills, and I stand before you, trusting you. It is God's love for us that causes him to bring us to an end of our own strength. He sees our need to trust in him, and his love is so great that he will not let us live another day without turning over our arms to him, our fears, or our worries, even our confusion, so that nothing becomes more significant to us than our Father. Never, ever forget it. The battle is the Lord's. Remember, winning victories is extremely significant. Remember them. Where do you keep your memories? Do you quickly pass over the victories? Break that habit. God doesn't waste victories. When he pulls something off that only he can do, he says to us, now don't you forget that. In Old Testament times, God had his people pile up huge stacks of stones as reminders of his winning various victories on their behalf. Those stones of remembrance were to remain for all to see and remember. The biblical account of David and Goliath is one of the most popular stories from scripture. It is a lesson of courage, faith, and overcoming what seems impossible. So often when facing our own giants, we forget we ought to remember and we remember what we ought to forget. We remember our defeats and we forget the victories. Most of us can recite the failures of our lives in vivid detail, but we're hard pressed to name the specific remarkable victories God has pulled off in our past. Not so with David. He says, you know why I can fight Goliath, Saul? 
Because the same God who gave me power over a lion and a bear will give me power over Goliath. What works for one person will not necessarily work for someone else. We're always trying to put our armor on someone else or put someone else's armor on ourselves. But that's not the way to do battle.